Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Combermere Live. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Charles Lewis, better known as Charlie Spice. Glad that you're here with us, Charlie. I'm happy that you agreed to be a guest with us tonight. However, I have to ask the question, why would you decide to do this interview knowing that some people will be judgmental of you? Well, first of all, guys, I want to thank you very much for inviting me onto the show as a guest. Uh, I've been looking forward to this all day. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get stuck into this discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't, um, I've always welcomed the opportunity to speak about my life and in, uh, you know, before the industry and after I got into the sex industry, because it gives me an opportunity to show people who I really am. I'm not worried about people being judgmental. I've have I've had that all my life. And I've often found out when I did research on those who were being judgmental and pointing fingers at me, when I checked into their their files or their closets, <laughs> I I wonder why they even, you know, why they're even judgmental about me in the first place. When I found out what was inside their closets, the skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> well. My mother always told me never to throw stones or point fingers at other people, you know, because when you point fingers, there's a three pointing back at you. So I say, I, live should, I should commend you as I should commend you for having uh, the courage to, <laughs> to, to interview me uh, on Comrade. Right, right, what, what, that, there shouldn't be a courage. You are a Comrade I'm a Comrade This is a Comrade show. And we, you know, we speak to the good, the bad, the indifferent. They're all Comrade We don't care. Absolutely. I totally agree. As a matter of fact, I'm going to expand that thought for a bit. I've often felt that, you know, regardless to whatever you end up doing in life, whether you are a, a garbage collector or a vagrant or a bank president, as long as you are or you were a common mayor, the moment you enter into common mayor, either virtually or physically, you're a common marian. And Every, nothing else matters. I've always felt that way about it. But, um, you know, some uh, some people may think otherwise. Well, um, that's their problem, not ours. Um, so let's start at the very beginning and tell us about where did you grow up in Barbados and your early childhood? What was that like? I grew up in a very small village in St. Thomas, actually. It's called Arthur Seat. And um, a very tiny village at that time. Now it's grown considerably over the years. I've been back there recently and I cannot believe the number of you know, enormous houses that exist now. But I grew up in Abbasit with, um, you know, mother, father, and two sisters. And um, it was a very, it was a very, well, yes, there you go. They, that's a photo of my mother. She was quite attractive. Uh, uh, Beautiful lady. When she was uh, 18 or 19, she won the, the, the St. Thomas beauty pageant, actually. So, uh, <laughs> so I got my good looks from her, I guess, okay? Yes. We, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 so, and, by the way, and by the way, so did your sister. Uh, yes, actually, my sister was quite attractive. Yes. I had, there were so many guys begging me to put a word in for them with my sister when we were growing up. <laughs> she, gave them, she gave them hello, hell uh, to have a conversation. That's a photo of my father. My father was in the police department um, for, oh, I think, 39 or 40 years. When he retired, he was a senior superintendent uh, in charge of the Northern Division at Whole Town Police Station. Wow. It's, it's amazing you didn't get into the police uh, force. Well, I used to have a secret ambition to be a, an FBI agent, to be honest. <laughs> I, I thought that I would make an excellent investigator. And um, I have a, a, a strange fascination with forensic science. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think I've watched every crime documentary on YouTube that ever got produced <laughs> for the years. Wow. Wow. So what was your relationship with your parents? Uh, growing up? Admittedly, it was to some extent dysfunctional, my, my family dynamic. I, I had lots of domestic problems and um, it, 
it affected my my schooling when I was a common mayor actually, and um, I had, my mother was a strict disciplinarian. My father was he was more cool. Uh, you would have you would perhaps think that he would be more of a strict parent than my mother, but my mother was she did not spare the rod to spoil the child. That's for sure. Wow. <laughs> Well, that was, um, yeah, most of our households, you know, they um, put the fear of God in you or put some blows in you if you needed it. Um, what were, were your parents planning for you to go to Common Mayor? Or were my, you planning to go to Common Mayor? My father went to Common Mayor. Oh, wow. His brother went to Common Mayor. Wow. <laughs> So it's it's part of our it's part of our family, and um, so it was always intended for me to go there, and um, I was quite happy to end up going to Common Air. Wow! Give us um, um, an idea of your early um, experiences at Common Air. You know, for some reason, I don't have the, the type of memory that you have when we have our conversations off air and other comarians yeah. uh, for example i mean i cannot even find my a photo of me in any of the the um, you know the, the photos that were done in groups i've looked high and low and i've not been able to find any but um the going to the comare i was quite i was quite you know, I don't know. I wasn't loud. I was not. Um, I wasn't that. I was not a bad behaved child. I did get a. I did get some lashes, but uh, for being late. And but uh, I was quite unlike I, who I am today. Yeah, I remember you was quite, being quite reserved, and you know, um, and you quite know, timid as well. Yes. Yeah, you. But you were in the cadets with us. Yes, I joined the cadets. I I also went to St. Vincent yeah. with you as well uh, on camp. Yeah. We, that boat ride, I could never forget that boat ride. That was a uh, horrendous. Um, that, we call horrendous. that the, we call that the vomit comet. The vomit. <laughs> <laughs> we was vomiting like crazy on that on that trip, man. Yep, I remember, I remember that. No, that was an excellent. Um, that was a great experience for me. It gave me a lot of uh, discipline being in, in um, and also common mayor itself was, was it, it has done a lot for me throughout the years because the fraternity that we have as common Marians, I've, I've, I've carried that over to other associations that I, I, I came into o over the years. And uh, so common has been a very stabilizing experience for me over the years. Okay. Who, were the teachers or students that that influenced you that you looked up to when you were at Common Mayor? Mr. Jabod Singh was comes to mind as the the number one teacher who had a major impact on me because she recognized <clears throat> I was not a very good student. Okay, Let, let's let's get that out. <laughs> I could have done a lot better because I've always had the ability uh, the intelligence but because of my i became very rebellious as a result of my uh, the experiences i had within a, a, a somewhat dysfunctional family unit and um and i i remember not wanting to succeed to sort of get back at my parents that sounds a bit strange but i tried to fail and well, um you know and i did not apply myself to as much as i could have or should have uh, Mr. Jabod Singh called me to a side once and said to me, you know, you are quite intelligent and you have all the ability in the world, but there's something going on. And I told her, and um, it was an emotional moment that we shared. Um, I told her the problems that was happening at home. And um, and she encouraged me to, you know, to buckle down and, and you know, and in spite of, you know, you know situations at home, there's still, there's still every possibility to be successful you know, academically and uh, and beyond, and also to, uh, of course, Harry, good old Harry, who could always, you oh, know, oh yeah, Mr. Seeley, uh, yes, Mr. Harry Seeley, Harry Seeley was certainly an influential figure for me. KK, Mr. King, yes, uh, uh, Miss Lord French, yes, <laughs> Charlie, Charlie, uh, you know, Charlie Pilgrim. What am I saying, yes. Charlie Pilgrim? Yes. Um, yeah, so yeah, those were the those are the names that come to mind. 
I I participated in football. I was in I was not the best athlete, but I was I also ran. <laughs> So while you were at school, there's nothing in your personality or character to suggest that you would be now in the industry that you're in. Where did that come from? I never, um, when I was at school, I knew nothing about the sex industry. I did not, I mean, we all knew about Nelson Street and uh, girls on Bay Street, but that was it. That was the extent to which I had any knowledge about the, the sex trade and, um, and at school, obviously, they I, I've always been very chatty with the girls. I I remember at primary school, there were a couple of girls who would encourage their mothers to pack extra sandwiches for me. <laughs> so I I always had it in me, you know. The, yeah. You know, <laughs> but when it came to the to the ladies or the girls. So I always had that ability. I had the gift of the gab at school, I, although I wasn't that boisterous. I wasn't. Um, I, I was included in every, in all the parties. I was included going to um, the Vista uh, Cinema on, on the South Coast and and Chaffet and so on. Um, but I was not the character that was this the center of attention at all times. Um, so I was rather surprised when I got into the industry that. Um, you know, uh, when I went to Los Angeles, because there was nothing in my in my youth that suggested that. I mean, you knew me when I was at school. Did you think yeah. for one minute that I would get involved in the sex trade? Or uh, no, of course not. You know, that never <laughs> even crossed our anybody's mind. You know, but we all gravitate to different things. I I never even thought that my myself would be living in the United States. You know, I yeah. was a Barbadian. I loved where I was, but just things come about in your life and. And, and life happens and you have to adapt. So obviously yeah. things like that happen to you. So how did you end up in Los Angeles? Um, I, as a kid, I was always running away from the problems at home and the relation, the, you know, the, the dysfunctionality. I would run away to my grandmother's house next door. I would run to my aunt's house on the South Coast. But you know, this, I would always go back home. You know, when you get hungry, you go home. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> So I wasn't very good at running away. I tried okay. many times. And uh, it was always in me to leave Barbados. I always wanted to get away from this little rock and uh, and conquer the world. And I got the, I walked into the embassy to apply for a visa. And I hadn't, there was no apparent reason for me to get a visa. But I was able to talk my way into it. And I was given the first visa at a very young age. And um, I... It, it's interesting to to note how I got the money to go away. When I was a kid, my grandmother had a rum shop in St. Thomas. And I learned to play pool on that in that rum shop. Oh, wow. And I became very good at it. My uncle used to take me all over the island at 13, 14 years old. He was taking me to rum shops all over Barbados to play against much older guys or, uh -huh. or men. And I would kick their butts every time. I was that good. I used to sleep on that pool table. Okay. And and that is how I earned the money to, you know, I mean, apart from what I had worked for, I, I played pool and won enough money to go to the United States. The first time I got to New York, the person that was supposed to meet me never turned up. So I ended up sleeping at the airport for three wow. days waiting for the flight to go back to Barbados. Wow. <laughs> that was my first experience. I never even got outside the airport because wow. I wasn't going to miss that flight. Okay. So I slept at the airport for three days, came back to Barbados, back on the pool table, made some money. I was off again. My... Wow. I had worked as well. I mean, when I first, I remember my father, knowing that I was quite wayward and uh, quite rebellious, my father got me a vacation job at Glendary Prison. I guess he wanted <laughs> to show me what would happen to the people who went the wrong way in Jeez. life. And I, worked, I worked at Glendary for one day. I couldn't wow. take it anymore. When I, when I, actually, it was quite it was quite in, intriguing to to be with the prisoners who were known as trustees because they were allowed to come into the office and you know, and I was instead of work, I work instead of working, I would actually interview 
all of the prisoners. So why why were you here? Oh well, I raped three women and I I killed uh, two people and I have broken I broke into many houses and I'm talking to these guys like it's just a normal conversation, right? Wow. <laughs> and I was so intrigued by by these guys. Just listen to the stories. Wow. Um, and uh, of course, I I only stayed one day. I I told him no, this is not for me. But it was very interesting to have that experience for one day <laughs> working. Uh, I also became a, an immigration officer. Uh, when the Barbados government decided to take the responsibility of immigration duties away from the police and give it to civilians, I was one of the first civilians to be trained. I got trained for six months at, um, was it six months? No, was it? It was about two months, I think, um, at District A Police Station in Station Hill. And I became one of the very, the very first civilians to be an immigration officer at the airport. So... Uh, that was quite interesting. I stayed there for about, um, I was there for about six months, and then I got the opportunity to work with BWIA. Um, do you know the acronym is uh, But Will It Arrive? Because BW was always late. So well, we used but, to call it Better Walk. We used but, to say yeah. Better Walk If Able. <laughs> 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 yes, so I I got the opportunity to work with them for about a year. I had always wanted to become, I, I used to go to the airport as a kid and was so fascinated with the airport staff in their smart uniforms and looking all handsome or very attractive ladies. And um, and I wanted I wanted to work at the airport. And uh, when I got to work with BWA, I, I um I then wanted to go on to be an air steward. So I went to Trinidad to train and I was successful. I, and uh, But I, I made the decision to go to the United States instead of taking up that opportunity to be an air steward. And um, I there I was in first, well I, well, I went to New York first and I inched my way down to LA. And I'll tell you, there's a bit of backstory about Los Angeles for me. When I was growing up in, in Barbados, uh, my, my grandmother from my mother's side is... is she was from uh, St. Thomas, uh, Reese Hill, uh, and um, she was one of the only persons with a television at that time, and it was a black and white television. And being the grandson, I was privileged to sit on the inside while all the other kids were on the outside looking in the window, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I used to say to everyone, I'm going to go to Los Angeles. I want to see where they make the movies. And kids would just fall on the floor laughing. You must be crazy. You're not going to get to Los Angeles. And let me tell you, I was determined that I was going to get to Los Angeles and go to Universal Studios. But I started off in New York, failed about three times to get into the United States. And finally, on the fourth attempt, I, I was there I stayed three and a half years, three and a half, four years, actually. I, I moved from L, from New York down to, to Florida, and then I inched my way over and, and I got to Los Angeles. The only determination and motivation um, I had about was that, was was bragging to my friends that I'm going to get to Universal Studios. And this might sound funny, but that was that was my motivation to get to Los Angeles. You know? <laughs> and I did. <laughs> And uh, I found out I had relatives there and so on. So I was able to itch my way from relative, to, you know, one relative to, to the next. And um, uh, my journey in the United States was quite interesting because when I, part of that journey took me to a place called Palo Alto, which is just outside Stanford University. Yeah. And um, I stayed with a family. I was with an, uh, a, a second or third cousin in a place called um, Monterey by Seaside. Yeah. And that is where I met Clint Eastwood because he was the governor. Don't forget of uh, 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 of Montreal yeah. Seaside, and um, and I I stayed by her for a little while, but that became a bit that situation became a bit untenable. And um, I had met one of her friends who came to visit her. They were from Louisiana, but lived in Palo Alto, so they invited me to come visit them from 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 Monterey. And when they were leaving, I had my bags packed. Well, and I was the first person in that car. They had not invited me to go at that time. Uh -huh. They were not leaving without me. So I, I, uh, I packed up and left, and I went to stay to stay by them for a while. And it turned out that his son was a, a big drug dealer. His brother was a was an even bigger drug dealer. Oh boy! And there I am living in his house, surrounded by drug dealers. And at that time. The guys used to have 
these low rider cars that would go up and down. You know, they would. Yeah, they I remember would, those. Yeah. yeah. I would jump, jump to the music. He had one of those as well, and the, it, it, it was a Buick and white wall tires. Of it was clean as a whistle. And um, now there was there were two sons and a daughter, and the daughter had fancied me. And the first night I got there, she came into the bedroom when she thought that everyone, everyone was as well. But she thought her brother was asleep because one brother had already moved out. One brother was there, and she was engaged to be married to a Marine. She came into my bedroom the very first night, yes, wow. and said to me, if you do not make love to me, I'm going to tell my father you tried to rape me. Oh, my goodness. And I kid you <laughs> not. And uh, we, we were in two uh, single beds side by side, the brother on one side and I'm on the other, or she and I are on the other. And that went on for some time until the brother came to me one day and said, Charlie, uh, I just want you to know that I know that you were sleeping with my sister, all right? But it's all right. I, 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 <laughs> not a problem. When I, when I thought he was sleeping all that oh time. Oh, my goodness, yeah. So anyway, that is um, I, that was a, an interesting experience in Palo Alto because I remember the uncle had said to me one day, he said, Charlie, you have... You have the ability to communicate quite effectively. You obviously have had a good education. I don't know why he was telling me that when I I, I thought I failed miserably at Common Air. Mm -hmm. And um and um he said you would do extremely well as a drug dealer getting into the, the white community. This is exactly what he said to me, with your mm -hmm. ability, the way you look, your presentation and so on. And uh I, I said, but that's not my thing. I am not interested. Mm -hmm. I, he took a shotgun and aimed it at the wall next to my head and fired that shotgun into the wall wow. to let me know if you are not with us, you are against us. Wow. Make your choice. And that was the beginning of my, of the, that was the beginning of my, my plan to leave Palo Alto. It took me about three months. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to, to plan it properly. <laughs> uh, I see someone in the chat room is asking if she forced she forced me. No, she didn't. Well, in a way, she did because I was really scared of the brother and the uncle. So, in a way, yes. Uh, so that was um, there. There was another occasion when when she actually got married to the Marine, and she said to me just before the wedding, "To Charlie, if you would agree to be with me, I would not get married to this man." And I'm like, well, "No, no, no." No, you please get married to him. Go, it, no, no, no. You, it's too late to back out now. You got to go do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> boy, that's crazy. So, what? How did? How did you move out of that situation? Um, from there, I I got an opportunity to work with um, doing some work with the Barbados Tourist Authority or a Tourist Office at that time. The head of the office in Los Angeles was a friend of mine, and uh, he had a budget to employ uh, people on the ground in Los Angeles, people who were not appointed by Barbados. And uh, he gave me the opportunity to do some work with him, doing sales, uh, sales, and um, to travel agents. And um, that is how I got to to Los Angeles. And um, I, my first, the. I know you want to get quickly into how I got into the sex industry, but there's this no, no, no. You, 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 yeah. mm. Yes. Um, because my life is full of crazy experiences. Now he working with him uh, gave me the opportunity to meet a Jewish investor who wanted to start charter flights to the Caribbean. Okay. And um he wanted me to work with him, go back to go back to to the Bay Area, just, just around the San Francisco area, to market his charter flights to travel agencies. But little did I know that that was one of the biggest scams that the the um, the tourism offices in the Caribbean ever got involved in, well, unbeknownst to, to the officials. He was running this scam where he was promoting his charter flights and I was um, promoting to travel agencies. And uh, he, had, he had amassed over close to $2 million in deposits from people who wanted to take these flights. He absconded with all the money. Oh, boy. Wow. Um, I remember my friend calling me and saying, Charlie, 
drop whatever you're doing now, leave that office and get out. The FBI is investigating this man and anyone connected to him. But wow. um, and this is a Jewish guy that um, I don't think they ever caught him. I don't I've never heard about him being caught. Um, you know, so, yeah, that was another crazy experience in my life. Um, I now the, the question was how I got to L.A. or how I got into the industry. How you got into the industry, because we, we okay. figured out how you got to L.A. One day I was um, things after the, the, the it, it became a problem me working for the tourist office because he could not justify it anymore. And besides, people, it was kind of on, it was kind of, it was not an official situation. And um, I decided to do some promotions and uh, to make some money. But but it became very difficult because I had to pay my own rent. I had to pay, pay my own food. I didn't have any family support when I was in LA. And uh, it got so difficult one day that a friend of mine, actually, another Calmerian, Charlie Brown, who is now a very accomplished gynecologist and, obst and uh, an obstetrician in Seattle, Washington. He and I used to party like crazy in LA and we were outside of um, uh, uh, Burger King one day thinking whether or not, or wondering whether or not we should get a job at Burger King. And I remember <laughs> saying to Charlie, I remember saying to Charlie, there's no way in hell I would put that silly hat on my head. Yeah. <laughs> and that same day, when I was walking by the Sherman Oaks Galleria, this drop dead gorgeous blonde lady came by in an, Ast an Aston Martin convertible, which is now a classic car. Yeah. Uh, and you could you could just see the money dripping off of this woman. Yeah? And so she came to a stoplight, looked at me, and gave me the biggest smile. And I could see that she was intrigued by this young man. And um, anyway, the light turned green and she was off. I walked into a cafe. Ten minutes later, the same lady walks into my into my space and said to me, you would make, excuse me, but you would make a, a, a very successful es male escort. And I was like, <laughs> what? What, the, what is that? What is an escort? She said, you know, a man who would, take out women for lunch, for dinner, and have fun, and travel with them, and so on, and get paid for it. I'm like, well, if that's a choice between Burger King, yeah, <laughs> and, like and yeah. I started thinking about the gift of the gab that I had back in Barbados, talking yeah. to all the pretty girls, and so on, and being very, very, you know, you know, I, I was full of, full of the, I had a lot of uh, swagger back then. Mm. I said, bring it on. When can, sign me up? When can I start? Anyway, I um, she gave me the opportunity to work with her agency. She owned an agency that had very sophisticated ladies who provide sexual services to very wealthy men, particularly in the entertainment, in the in the in the film production, you know, uh, sector. And um, but she didn't have any guys. I was the only guy. She made me think that she she worked with guys, but really she did it as a as an excuse to get close to me because she she wanted to have an uh, an affair with me. Wow! And, um, she never had a black man before. She never she didn't even know what the hell to say to me when she first met me. So anyway, so she then contacted her girlfriends and asked them to sort of go along with her little her little role play scenario, and I ended up going up with her friends and they paid me. The first time I went up with a woman. Uh, we went out partying and drinking and have dancing. I got paid five hundred US dollars. At that time, that was a hell of a lot of money. Wow, yeah. <laughs> and I and I'm like, it's still a decent sum today. Absolutely. So yeah. I was um I was a male escort for about three years, but that morphed into male stripping as well. I didn't strip for a club. I would strip for my private clients. But so, let me ask you this question, though. As being an, a male escort, did that involve sexual activities? I, I, oh my God! Absolutely. Okay. And, um, I just gotta know. I was, I was young, and I could, I could have sex all night long. At this stage in my life, you're lucky. You're lucky. You get 15 minutes out of me. But anyway. Um, <laughs> 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 but it would be the best 15 minutes of their life, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so 
absolutely. It's not. Um, that's exactly what it is. I mean, it might start with cocktails and dancing and, you know, you know, cuddling and so on, but it will end up back at the hotel or back at uh, one of their properties. Uh, and these were extremely wealthy women. I mean, my first car was bought by one of my clients in L.A. My de the deposit for one of my the deposit for my first property was given to me by one of my clients. So it was extremely lucrative for me. And I, I somehow had the uncanny ability to do this job flawlessly. Uh, in the beginning, it was quite difficult because when you go out to a club and you meet an attractive lady, you go, you, you make a conscious decision to talk to that lady, but and, and, it's, and it's easy because, you know, you, boy meets girl, girl meets boy. So, but when you are paid to do it and it's not a it's a professional situation, it can be quite daunting. And it was for me in the beginning. But I quickly learned to separate mind from body and get into that conscious space to be able to perform and do my job uh, professionally. And I, I became very good at it. Wow. Um. I have to ask this question because I know the the, the 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 viewers out there would probably want to know. You didn't you didn't have to escort no guys, did you? No, not okay. at all. <laughs> I get that question. I get that question very often. Um, <laughs> but when I left Barbados, I was very homophobic because that is the culture we you know we grew up in, mm. and uh, I you know you see to you see a guy who's gay and you 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 know, you give him hell, you know, that, that was it. We would throw rocks at him, that sort of thing as a kid. But when I got to the United States, particularly Los Angeles, I realized that that was nonsense. The world is, the world is, is in, there are many different people in this world and we have to learn how to be inclusive and to yeah. be accepting of everyone, regardless of their sexuality, regardless of of you know we fought for many years not to be judged by our color now here we are wanting to judge or judging somebody because of you know their, their sexual persuasion so i have some of the best i've got some friends around the world who are gay and they are super super individuals i am not homophobic in the least as a matter of fact i support any person's choice to be who they want to be in this life I, I totally agree with you, Charlie. I grew up in the green field around all different types of people, prostitutes, thieves, robbers, and there was just the politicians. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no, we grew up around all these people and, and you realize that people are people. Some people, they had, they had no other choice but to do this. I know a lot of the, the ladies um, that had households with children and they were feeding trying to feed their families and this was the only job that they could do so i knew them as a human being and not as something else that people would would scorn so i never looked down upon anybody you know so live and let live is my yes. my thing you know so how did you gravitate also, do, what, now what, from what is, los angeles yeah. and um and move on to because i know you went to europe so how do we get to that I was in LA for about four years, and um, I, I'm, I worked with her for three of those years, and um, the last year I started to manage the agency for her. So I got my first experience as an, you know, in management of a business, and it, um, and again, I was quite good at it as well. You know, I, it, people. People always question me about how, I mean, because I, I went to church every Sunday when I was a kid. My grandmother would not let me miss a Sunday, Sunday yeah. school practice. They, I can quote many of the scriptures. You, you take me to a church and they start singing hymns. I can sing some of those hymns verbatim. So it, it, it made me quite grounded. And there, there are many lines beyond which I would never go from having that, that background. That, that Christian background, and um, but you know when you get out into the real world, the, the, the wider world, you do what you have to do to survive. And um, I don't have any regrets going into the industry. Let me say that before we go any further. Mm -hmm. um, when I when I left Los Angeles, I went back to Barbados for a, um, I went back to Barbados for about two three months, and uh, I met a young lady from. 
Berlin, Germany, who invited me to come back with her, and um, I was off again. Now, it's, it's interesting to know why I left Los Angeles. It, I didn't leave by on my own volition. I was at, I had to leave because while I was working in the sex industry there, I was developing a concept called the, you know, it, it was it was a video camera rental company. Panasonic had um, I saw Zenith, sorry, the company Zenith uh, produced a commercial uh, introducing this new camcorder, which was quite big, quite heavy and, and very expensive. And when I watched that, I immediately got the idea that that is a business concept right there. I, if I could find a way to get those cameras uh, mm -hmm. to rent them to tourists, because I already had the experience of working in the tourism sector uh, with, with, with my with my friend with it from the tourist office. And I recognized that that was an opportunity, uh, but how in heaven's name am I going to get the funding to buy these cameras. These cameras yeah. were like three thousand, what three four thousand dollars back at the time, right? Yeah. And the first came out. Anyway, I called up Panasonic and lied to them. I convinced <laughs> them. I convinced them that Zenith was in discussions with me oh, to, to advance me on a line of credit twenty five cameras to market them within the tourism sector where travel agencies would make the booking on a 10% commission. Uh, video stories would house the camera and actually manage the, 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 the uh, facilitate the actual rental. And um, they would get 30%, travel agencies would got 10% and the rest would come to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Panasonic, they were so excited about that idea because it was an opportunity to get their product into the marketplace uh, as a as a as a branding and marketing strategy, and um, and then eventually sales. So, I they invited me to a meeting and uh, and convinced that if they hadn't worked with me, I yeah. would go to you go to their competitor. Yeah. That's yeah. why I would I would have gone to Zenith. Yeah. Anyway, so I go, cut a long story short. As a matter of fact, let me just include one thing that was I'd always experienced racism in in America. As a matter of fact, wherever I've lived all over the world, I have I've, I've encountered racism, but it was nowhere was it greater than in Los Angeles at that moment when I was talking to Panasonic for about six weeks. I was speaking to the sales and the sales manager. I was speaking to the head of U.S. sales, and there were uh, at times um, conversations with the parent company called Masusista in Japan. Anyway, they came to, to, to New York on a conference and then decided to come down to meet this entrepreneur who is going to make a, a, a massive shift in sales through yeah. a, video, a video rental concept. Anyway, um, I, I did not even have a suit. I had to borrow a suit for that meeting, okay? And <laughs> um, got a ride down to uh, Orange County and I've never seen an office that big. It was the warehouse and the office. We're talking about three floor blocks, you know. Wow. And wow. Um, anyway, so I walked into the meeting and I said good morning to the receptionist. And I, I said to her, uh, good morning. I am uh, I'm Charles Lewis. She almost fell off her chair. You say, you are Charles Lewis? <laughs> I said, yes. She said, I'm sorry, but... I didn't realize you were black. No, I'm, I have been talking to this woman for six weeks. Wow, because, and she had the audacity to say that to you. He never thought because I don't. I don't speak with an American twang, yeah. especially a black, a black American. You know, what I mean. Yeah. And um, so she never thought that she thought I was white mm -hmm. from a foreign country, and um, and so did the sales manager. So did everyone. Now I've got this entire company motivated to back me on this project, and um, they brought on the, the the heavy guns from from Japan, who were at the time in in New York, in New Jersey. Sorry, they came over, and she said, "Wait till the sales manager sees you." I can't wait. So she called and said, <laughs> uh, "I don't remember his name." I said, "Let's say Mr. Smith." Mr. Smith, uh, Charles Lewis is here, and she's giggling. You know. Uh -huh. Anyway, um, they came out with this corporate gush of wind and I mean high powered suits. Uh -huh. And they went, they passed me and went to the first white guy who sat next <laughs> to me. Mr. Lewis? He said no. They went, uh -huh. to the, they went 
the next one, Mr. Lewitt, no. They went uh, around the entire room asking every white executive who well, was there for me if he was Mr. Lewis. When they got to the end and realized or wondered, could that black man, they probably use another word, <laughs> could that black man be, be Charles Lewis? <laughs> wow. At that point in time, while they were making the rounds, Mm -hmm. I knew I was going to get those cameras because I was very conscious about the NAACP and racism and how you could take legal action and so on and, and, and affirmative action. I was yeah. quite versed in all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I knew that if these bastards did not give me, I'm going to go to the NAACP and they're going to back me with a high power of attorney to take legal action because there's no way I'm going to take no for an answer now. And mm -hmm. it made me very powerful. I mean, I'm, I'm about 22 years old, you know, 20, 22, 23. Anyway, and um, so they came back to me and that walk back to me was like 10 miles long. And they came over and they, they shook my hand and said to me, we owe you an apology. Oh. We, didn't think, we didn't think you were black. Oh. I mean, it was, it was the elephant in the room Yes, he was. It was a black elephant. Yeah, <laughs> it was so big that you could not, you could not, uh, but but see it and feel it. You know. Yeah. Anyway, um, so we so we didn't think you were black. Forgive us. You know, we're sorry. I said no problem. I, sh I shook their hands so firmly, Hess. Mm -hmm. I tell you, it, I was so confident, and I was okay. Well, let's begin. Where shall we go? You know, I'm in control now because they're now. They have that egg on their faces right now. They're backpedaling, they're backpedaling. Oh, oh, yeah. So we went into the yeah. room and we started talking and um and um they, there was no long discussion. It was it was predetermined I was gonna get these cameras. And yeah. I got 25 cameras from them. I got the I got the business started. I uh I got to they gave me a total of 75 over a period of three months. I had about 13 blockbuster video stories in around uh, Southern California with my cameras. We were doing about 75 to 100 reservations a day. And my cameras were going all over the world. Similarly to renting a car, people would leave a deposit on their credit card. And I am making a ton of money. I've got about 13, 14 employees. No, 17 employees. And I don't have a green card. I've overstayed my welcome in the United States. <laughs> I am illegal in the United States. But I run things. Oh, I, God. I, I'm, I'm running things, yes. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, so I one day I'm in the office and I've got my foot up on the chair and I'm like, I've arrived. This is, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, that's the that's the American dream right there, you know. You, yeah. Everyone has the ability, to, you know. And um, I was driving a Lincoln Continental Mark Seven, a brand new car. I had an amazing <laughs> apartment, you know, mm. and. Uh, I remember bringing my mother and sister to visit me in California. I paid for the tickets. And uh, when my mother got to the airport and saw the car I was driving, she said, I'm not getting in that. <laughs> she said, you, you've got to be selling drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I am not getting in. I had to pay a taxi wow. to, my to my apartment. She would wow. not get in the car. Wow. No. And I said, well, if you got a problem getting the car, you might have a problem staying in my place. I have an amazing apartment, and uh, I'm not paying for a hotel for you. So, <laughs> so, wow. so these are some of the, you know. And um, one day I'm sitting in the office. My my foot is on the is on the desk, and uh, and the immigration came in. Uh, and I, no, b before that, I had to take a partner on board who was American. Because it got to a point where I I felt I needed to do something to get myself, you know, to, to, to protect myself from these possibilities. I even asked my friend from uh, from Los Angeles to find me a woman to marry. I paid a woman to fifteen thousand dollars to marry me to get my green card. I wow. never got it, by the way. And um, and I and I said to him, I need a woman that was real fat, real ugly. And much older than I am, because I don't want any possibility of having a long-term relationship with this woman. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> anyway, so um, I, I actually that was my first. That was the first time I got married, and um, I remember talking about getting married, and uh, we went downtown, downtown LA to just inquire about it. Yeah, and I came, I came back married because at that time there were so many outlets where you you know get married in twenty four hours, get married today, and yeah. I came back married. I did not even have a ring. 
Okay, so <laughs> anyway, um, actually, that picture it was is my that's the, my second wife. Okay, exactly. you know, so um, she's from South Korea, and uh, we have two sons. We met in Germany, and um, we moved back to Switzerland. But that is, um, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Anyway, to that. long story short, my partner showed me the true meaning of capitalism in America. He told the immigration that I was illegal, and wow. they came in and they arrested me. So he took over the business? He took over the business. Wow. But um, when the immigration officers heard my story and my journey into the United States, and this, she said, the, the lady said to me, you're the type of immigrant we want in America. We don't want to deport you, but you're going to, you can't, you can't take any money from the account. Now, I've got credit cards because wow. I had a, a social security number, which I got from a woman that I just had to smile with and promise to take her for dinner. And she gave me a social security card and everything else followed. And um, she, they said, well, you can't, you know, all the money you made, you made illegally. So you can't have access oh, to that. Boy. Yeah. If you can buy your own ticket and leave, we are not going to deport you. We'll let you leave on your own volition. Mm -hmm. And uh, and before I left, she said to me, I'll do you one big favor. I'll tell you who told us that you were illegal. Wow. It's, your, it's your business partner. Wow. That's how I ended up back in Barbados. I was not deported. She said you can stay away for six months and come back. Wow. So, okay. so I don't have any issues with the United States. But, um, yeah, that is how I went back home. And um, I met a lovely young lady who was on holiday in Barbados, she was coming there for quite a long time. With She's from a very, very wealthy family. And uh, I I was off to Berlin, Germany, and um, fell in love with Berlin. I, I thought that it would be a different experience to what it, what it was. At that time, the Berlin Wall was still up. Okay. Okay. And um, you got the, the French on one side, the English and the Germany, the, the, the Germans, the Russians. And um, it was quite an interesting city at that time. And um, I ended up staying in Germany for about four and a half, five years. And that was the pinnacle of my tenure in the industry because I, that's when I started to get extremely wealthy clients. I started an agency and uh, I was staying um right in the center by the Kudam. I don't know if any of uh, your view, the viewers know about uh, Berlin, but the Kufersten Dam was the main street and I was just around the corner there in a beautiful um, apartment on the third floor, which I ran as, a, as an agency. I had about 15, 20 ladies working with me from all over the world. And I met, a, uh, I met a, another Jewish guy. <laughs> hmm. My previous experience did not uh, cause me to distrust <laughs> all Jews. <laughs> I met a very wealthy Jewish guy who was into jewelry, um, custom design jewelry that he would sell for a hundred thousand Deutsche marks. It was Deutsche marks at the time, not euros. And um, his, when I was in his office, Morgan Fairchild, the famous actress, had flown yes. in from LA to buy a piece of jewelry from him for about a hundred and fifty thousand. Wow, uh, you know. And um, he had called me in there for a meeting because he said to me, you know, I heard about you, Charlie, and uh, I want you to understand that it is important for you to have the right clothing, the right vehicle, if you're going to do business, uh, provide your service to my friends and my yeah. associates. He sent me to a, a store called Patrick Hellman uh, to put 12 suits on his account. The guy, I had some custom fitted suits, shoes. And then wow. he got his driver to take me to a, a garage where I picked out a, a Mercedes, which was his. <laughs> he gave it to me. I was allowed to drive it because he yeah, had so yeah. many cars, right? He didn't uh -huh. give it to me. Um, I got to keep the suits, nevertheless. <laughs> and um, he started to introduce me to some of the very, very wealthy people. And and um, my my business just took off from there. I I have I can boast having some of the wealthiest clients over the years. And um, I dare say that I've even I've had politicians, I've had top executives, and I've had royalty. That's right. Hey. We will not, we will not expand on that anymore. And of course not. <laughs> you know, and that's you know, I guess in your business, um, privacy and secrecy is paramount. Absolutely, I could not have achieved um, what I what I what I did without. Uh, without discretion, it's very important in my business. Yeah, 
Yes. So now you obviously you can speak German. What other languages can you speak? Um, my German is quite good actually. I my French. Bec- I lived in the Canton du Valais, which is the French part of Switzerland, in a tiny village called Champery, which is a ski resort called Port du Soleil. I was the only. It was it was on a mountain top with about eleven hundred people, and I was the only black man. Well, <laughs> story of my life. I've lived in places where I was always the only <laughs> black man. Uh, anyway, and um, I. That's. It's useful to live in the country and to be able to speak the language. I remember when Miss Lord was trying to teach me French and um, and also Miss Nurse, I just could not take it in. And uh, now je peux parler un petit peu de français. I am quite, you know, um, I, I can hold my own. I mean, my wife, my kids, uh, I spoke French with them every day for six years. Wow. Von kann ich Deutschland besuchen? <laughs> I'm not. I, I un, I've understood a few words of that, but not the whole sentence. Eh? <laughs> so, with your experience in Europe, did you um, encounter any dangerous situations while you were there? Um, yes, uh, particularly when I was in Eastern Europe, because when I left Switzerland. I was there for six years. I went to Eastern Europe. I had gone to to Eastern Europe to recruit girls for my agency, and um, and I fell in love with, with Riga, which is in Latvia, and uh, I ended up staying there. What should have been a two three week stint to uh, uh, for recruitment, I ended up living there. I got a lovely apartment, which is right across the street from the Parliament <laughs> in the old city. And um, I uh, now when at that time and perhaps still now, when you do a business in sort of in Eastern Europe, you have to notify one of the mafia groups that you're doing a business and and come to a decision how much you're going to pay them because you, whether it was a flower shop, a, a day nursery, it didn't matter. You had to pay, and I knew that, and uh, I was thinking that they would come to me when they were ready. So I set up shop, as you do, mm-hmm. <laughs> or not. And uh, I'm running my business, and it and no one came to me for about six months because each mafia group thought that I was with one of the other groups. With the other one, okay. So nobody bothered me, and I, I and I was the man about town. Everybody knew Charlie. Now the the you at that time I was of course I was known as Charlie Spice. One of my clients in Germany gave me the name Charlie Spice. So you're probably wondering how I moved from Charles Lewis to Charlie Spice. Yes, that's, um, yes. A German a German client gave, um, referred to me as Charlie Spice. And and I'm asking, why are you saying, you know, he said that that should be your name. That's a great name. And and he was right. It was more marketable than Charles Lewis. And uh, it was more uh, fitting, you know, it was fit for purpose. <laughs> and I adopted that name and... Um, Today, if anyone calls me Charles Lewis, I have to, I have to think, I have to think a bit to know they're talking to, they're talking to me, you know. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, I became known in well known in in Latvia, uh, and then at that time the Iron Curtain had come down. So many Westerners from Canada, the United States, UK, and elsewhere, they were coming into Eastern Europe to invest in property because it was quite inexpensive to acquire property. But that I could have had a two-bedroom apartment, I could have bought one for fifteen thousand US dollars back then. So you know, so there were lots of investors coming in, and they were more happy to do business with me to find uh, lovely ladies to entertain them while they were in town than go to the Russians who were. You know, you could tell that they were mafia. They were rough guys. They had they had Uzi guns and you know these leather jackets, and you, you knew who was the boss. You knew who were the security, and it was it was looking real serious back then. And um, anyway, um, I I ran my business for about six months, and uh, I did extremely well until one day I got an, a knock on the door, and uh, the boss of the biggest group in in um, well, they were. Ba- he was based in Latvia, but these mafia groups are connected all over Eastern Europe. Okay, mm. and um, 
he came to me and he said, Charlie, and he was laughing, this deep roar of a laugh. He said, you know, you are, you've got big balls, Charlie. You've got big balls. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Come into his turf and, and just uh, <laughs> do your thing. You don't, you do not belong to any of us, any of the groups. I said, no, I was waiting for somebody to come to me. You know? <laughs> he, said, he said, you are lucky to be alive. Wow. <laughs> said, you know, we kill people for this sort of thing. Uh-huh. And um, anyway, he said, but from today, you belong to us. And we want, <laughs> we want you to run our business the way you uh-huh. run yours. And um, I agreed, and we we had lots of we we, t- we talked for about a few days, and I moved from a, a small agency with about 15, 20 ladies to managing an operation with over twenty eight thousand girls all over wow. Eastern Europe, all over Eastern Europe. Wow! Czech Republic, Musk, uh, Russia, Hungary, uh, Lithuania, Estonia. That was all my territory, I'm, and I'm wow. traveling constantly. They gave me a fake passport. Well, first of all, they took my passport under the guise that they were going to get me naturalized. But uh-huh. that was just that was just a ploy. They want to get yeah. their hands on my passport so I would never run away. I right? yeah. never leave. And they gave me a, a, a fake passport, fake documents, and um, two security full time with guns with Uzis. Wow, and. Um, from that time on, and I had full control over all of the adult entertainment. I remember sitting at wrong table discussions where the guy across from me, he's responsible for assassinations. The one on the left, he's responsible for the drug trade. The one on the right, he's responsible for, for, for gun smuggling. <laughs> and, and again, the only black man in the room, uh-huh. I'm responsible for all the adult entertainment with in the casinos, in the bars, the clubs, the the... They, they they had palaces as well outside in the country, and um, and uh, I yeah that that became my life, and I never went anywhere without security, and it was it was it was not only to protect me but also to uh, to make sure I don't I don't run away. I suppose. Yeah yeah yeah. That's like living in a movie, man. Absolutely, absolutely. So how did you now get out of that situation or evolve from that situation? My assistant was an absolutely gorgeous young lady who spoke very good English and Russian and Latvian. And um, she started she started off as my translator, but then became my assistant. And then, you know, you know, little, you know, as in, in true Charlie Spice fashion, she became my girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> and um, her brother worked with immigration and she's the one who told me that they never they don't intend to give me back my passport. As, as a matter of fact, she knew exactly where my passport was. Wow. And her, brother, her brother had access to it. Wow. So she said, I will help you get your passport back, but you have to promise to take me with you wherever you go. Wow. Which was not a problem. I would, I would have gladly uh, done that. And um, it cost me about 5,000 US dollars. I even had bank accounts in my fake name. Mm-hmm. That I could access, but I couldn't go over a certain amount without a double signature. That was another way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Keep you on, you on the control. control. Yeah. And I had a mass close to three million US dollars in my account. Wow. That I could not get to unless I had a double signature, a second yeah. signature. <laughs> I, could, I could take out on a daily basis. I mean, I could take out five thousand dollars a day. That's not. I mean, yeah. that was nothing, you know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, yeah. So I. I paid the money to her brother and he got the passport for me and I left about five o'clock in the morning. It took me about six months to plan my departure. Okay. <laughs> it's not it's not something you do from one day to the next, right? Mm-hmm. And um, during that time, I traveled extensively all over. I've been to every almost every country in Eastern Europe working and um, I did a phenomenal job. We were making tons of money. I mean, on a good weekend, we could turn over half a million U.S. dollars all across Whoa. the state. Wow. Yep. Okay. And I was not lacking for anything. I had the best life, the best food, the best entertainment, mm-hmm. access to the best girls for me personally if I want. You know, so it was it was a charm life. And um, and But yes, I there was a time when there were a few near-death experiences when the mafia groups were always fighting amongst each other. And um, 
fighting for you know for territory and so on and there was a plan to put a bomb outside my apartment wow for me and mm -hmm. they got wind of it and they moved me just before uh, but what happened they got the wrong apartment they brought someone in for it. anyway the bomb went off at the apartment across um and that was a that was a, a, a red alert for this it. time it was time to play yeah yeah game. time to go also to i they were i had seen a lot of crazy stuff as well during my my tenure with them you know fights between shootouts and and the police never got involved the police would come by there's a shootout somebody's on the on the ground dead or or hurt and the police mm. would look and, and just just drive away they wouldn't get involved mm. that was how, how powerful they were wow and I was in a club one time, and this this young lady came up and wanted to dance with me and talk to me. And the guy she was working with, of course, got upset and came to me and started shouting in Russian. He pulled a knife out. He he's flicking his pen knife. Now I could not, I cannot speak Russian. Yeah. So I did not understand what he was saying, but I knew damn well he was saying he was going to kill me mm -hmm. <laughs> from from you know uh, from his body language and. Uh, my security guards, he did not know who I was. Yeah, of so course not. The security guards went to him, whispered something in his ear. He came over to me, he put the knife away, came over to me, hugged me, kissed me on both cheeks. <laughs> my hand, I walked away. <laughs> he met the real Godfather. He met the black Godfather. Well, I, I wasn't the Godfather, but I was <laughs> working with the Godfather. Huh? I was. <laughs> And wow. um, that was uh, that's, uh, that, that's something I would take to my grave. I, I every time I talk, even though I'm talking about it now, I, I you know I get chills talking about it because mm -hmm. I could have my life could have ended that night. Yeah, he could have stabbed me before he knew who I was. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. anyway, so um, I I left Europe and um, when I finally got my passport, and what's interesting is that. She couldn't go with me because I didn't have the funds. I could only access $5,000 US at a time. So I got that, went to London, and I promised her I was going to send for her. But by the time I, I got settled and tried to get in touch, she was nowhere to be found. And oh, I, wow. found out, I found out four or five months later that they, they, had, they had learned that she helped me. And oh, they, she almost, I mean, they took her into the country and... They beat the hell out of her, or her brother, or her family. Wow. And gang raped her and so on. Oh, yeah, she went oh, through hell right. because of me. And I was determined to get her out. So when I finally, when she finally resurfaced, I sent her a ticket and um, I brought her straight to Barbados. We came, oh, wow. We came Barbados, yes. She was so strikingly beautiful that if she ever stopped in, in Bridgetown for too long, people think she's a mannequin. I mean, <laughs> she, was not, she was that beautiful. Wow. Yes. Wow. In fact, I brought her to Kamamira. I was on one of the old scholars' reunion parties. Mm -hmm. She was with me. Oh, yeah. I I could imagine how them fellas get on down there. Mm, yep. Yes. So, yes, yes. so, so Charlie boy, we, we are over an hour talking with you. We're going to have to um, we could continue a little bit more. You just tell me to go ahead or we can we're going to have to do a part two on this bad boy. No, we have to do a part two. I have no problem with that. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of questions you want to ask. Oh, me. yes, man. Yeah, we have a lot of questions, but it's been quite, quite interesting to hear all of this background and story of who Charles Lewis uh, is and was and how you became and metamorphosized into this Charlie Spice person. It was, there are many people who would not agree with my choice or choices. And um, I, I entertain their opinions, of course. Um, and many people, of course, are judgmental and unforgiving. But I've come to find out a long time ago that those individuals represent the minority. The only reason the sex industry is so pervasive and so successful is because the majority of people support the industry. So it grows exponentially from yeah. year to year. Yeah. Um, and there, and of course, because of the many recessions that the world has experienced, uh, stock market recession, and, and, and more 
um, also the COVID is a lot to do with the growth of the industry because okay. many people were displaced as a result of COVID. And many women and men who swore they would never get into the sex industry mm -hmm. are now in the sex industry because needs must and uh, people do what they have to do. So you never say never and never judge people because you never know what you have to do in life to survive. Um, so I've come to realize that the people who uh, who may speak against what I do, and I, I, I entertain that. I, I quite, I totally accept that not everyone will agree with my choice and um you know, and I, I could accept their opinion more than so than they can accept mine. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not here to glorify my industry. I'm not here to encourage anyone to get into my industry. I'm here to to speak openly about my choices, who I am, and um, and get, give people an opportunity to get to know me. Because many people who speak ill of me don't really know me. Definitely so. And I can I could I could I could get over thirty thousand women tell you. That I'm a good man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried about 10 who might hate me or, because, or might have a, a strong opinion against what I've done. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, at the end of the day, you know, everyone makes choices, you know what I mean? And you're responsible for your choices, you know, Absolutely. and that's it. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. Well, I, I want to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come on the show and, uh, and, uh, and, and having the courage to be my to be my host, um, I would love the opportunity to come back again and continue. Because Almost really definitely so, because we've barely kind of scratched the surface now. We have to delve in deeper because we, there's a lot more to know about Charlie Spice. Of course, there are lots of there are many nuances and complexities to my life yes. and my industry and so on. And, and um, I would love to get the opportunity to talk about the work that I do with the United Nations as an advisor. I want to talk about my guest lecturing at the university which many people don't know about. I lecture on the global sex trade and the impact that it has on the sustainability of tourism. I lecture to, to um, final year students in tourism management studies. I also lecture to sociology students. You know, So there's a lot to me that people don't know. People love to just focus on what is salacious. Oh, you know. You yeah. Know, they don't know that you're trying to help the, the workers now unionize and get benefits like health care and all that stuff. So you're Absolutely. yeah, you're mobilizing Absolutely. and trying to steer them in the right direction. You know? Absolutely. You know, this is my industry. I've been in it for so long. I've been in this industry for over 30, about 38 years. And um, so these are my people and I will do whatever I, I can to help them and um, to guide them in the right direction and, um, and try to minimize the problems that people face in the industry, the forced prostitution, the the the, the trafficking, um, you know, and, and the other elements of criminality that have crept into the industry because there's there's a black there's a dark side to this industry. There's a dark side to all industries. <laughs> oh yeah. Most definitely so. Yeah. All right. So I think we will wrap up now on part one. Right? And um don't hold your breath. We're gonna do part two quite shortly. Right? So, Charlie, okay. great um, to hear from you and to delve into what makes you you. And it's been quite interesting. I hope our viewers have been captivated, as I have been, listening to your your life and your exploits. Um, I think one of these days, boy, you're going to have to get a movie done of your life. You understand? Well, the book is coming out soon. Yeah. It's been coming out for 20 years or so, but it's coming. <laughs> All right. So as a comma Marian, I will say to you, my brother, up and on. Up and on. Up and on till part two. <laughs>